I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'm going to now offer a talk uh, about the third in this kind of three-part series of focusing on the power of and practice of the simple word already. Um, just a quick review, first of all. Uh, as we've explored, as the Buddha taught, craving causes a lot of suffering. There is the pain, and I'll use that term distinctly, that's unavoidable in life. You know, a mosquito bite itches, someone is snappy towards you and snarky, it's kind of initially irritating, the brick falls on your foot, you stub your toe, you can't get to work on time because you're stuck in traffic and you're going to miss an important meeting um, that could have consequences for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is pain in this life. But the Buddha pointed out that on top of that inevitable pain is a lot of suffering that we create for ourselves. And we create it, he asserted, and he says, see for yourself what you find to be true. We create that suffering through craving. For example, in relationships, we can have insecure attachment. That's a kind of suffering. Uh, we can feel inadequate. Perhaps we experience being less than other people. Uh, we might manage our issues in relationships by craving to remain inside a comfort zone, inside the bars of our invisible cage, so that uh, we're, uh, that's, you know, we don't get rattled or upset. But even there is a kind of craving that enables us to avoid certain experiences and to avoid risking dreaded experiences. Different other kinds of craving in relationships involve feelings of envy or jealousy sense of clinging insecurely, needing a lot of reassurance, uh, resentment, ill will, vengeance, even hostility and hatred. So craving causes suffering. What causes craving? Now, craving, and here's where 2,500 years of science, or especially the last 250 years of science since the Buddha lived and taught, um, you know, has something to say. Craving is a drive state. Lizards crave in their way. Uh, spiders, if you disturb a spider, it craves escape. It wants to get away. Um, monkeys crave. Squirrels crave. Humans crave. Craving is biological, shaped by our evolution as mammals, primates, hominids, and humans. Craving, in biological terms, is a drive state that is activated by an invasive sense of an unmet need. This is really important. This is bringing biology to the four noble truths in Buddhism, the second of which is the truth of tanha, thirst, routinely translated as craving. The first noble truth is not suffering, extremely important. First noble truth is simply the fact of life that uh, there are sometimes painful experiences, noticing the word pain distinct from suffering. Also, even pleasant experiences eventually end. And all experiences are of the nature of being impermanent, insubstantial, and therefore incapable in any single case of providing lasting happiness. That's a fact of life. That fact of life continues after enlightenment. There is no end to the first noble truth of dukkha in the Pali word. On the other hand, it's when we add craving to dukkha that we start to suffer. Dukkha without craving is inner peace, feeling already okay, which is what we're going to be exploring here. So in this context, there's a quick review here. When we experience that needs are already met enough in the present, there is no actual basis for craving. 
This is incredibly useful to get. Craving causes suffering. A sense of unmet needs causes craving. Therefore, feeling that needs are met already enough in the present, boom, eliminates any actual basis for craving. Habits of craving may remain, but even those habits tend to fade away with time if they're not reinforced. Just the other day, I was wandering uh, back through a wonderful book with the strange title, Realizing Genjo Koan. This is from Dogen, great Zen master, Japanese, lived in the, roughly the 1200s, right around the time of the Japanese nun, whose uh, beautiful enlightenment experience involving the bottom falling out, triggered by the bottom falling out um, in the bucket she was carrying as an example of gradual cultivation and then <laughs> sudden awakening. Uh, she too lived around the time of Dogen, although I have no idea if they knew each other. Anyway, as Dogen writes here, having already, having arrived directly at the present, we are filled up and not hungry. Having arrived directly at the present, we are filled up and not hungry. This has enormous implications. We certainly do have needs for relationships. We have natural needs. You need to keep breathing. We are profoundly social animals. We do need to feel connected, to feel included, seen, appreciated, liked, and loved. There's no need for embarrassment about these needs. These are normal. These are natural. These are biologically given to us. We also need to feel and to be supportive and caring, to feel like we're contributing, even be loving. There's a need not just to receive, but to give. And my experience of many people in my own therapy practice over the years, and also in my own case, is that one of the the you know significant sources of suffering is a sense of being blocked or thwarted in the giving, in the outflowing of your heart. One reason I think adolescents are often teenagers often unhappy is we don't give them enough opportunities to make genuine contributions uh, to others and to the larger society based on kind of how we operate in many uh, certainly developed countries of the world today. So we have needs both to receive and to give. These are normal. So the question then becomes, how can we experience that our relational needs, our social needs, are indeed already, that word again, already met enough in the present? I'm kind of excited by this. I feel like it's almost like a detective thing. You know, like, how do we do it? You know? Okay, good. Um, two fundamental strategies. Strategy number one is for you to develop various inner strengths that help you meet your relationship needs in the real world. For real, practical, grounded. Like inner strengths like patience, staying calm in conflicts, having already a sense of self-worth, so you're not so hungry for or reactive to the lack of um, relationship supplies, narcissistic supplies. Um, strengths like being able to stay calm in conflicts. Strengths, empathy, compassion for others, communication skills, assertiveness skills. These are various inner strengths that help us to actually meet our needs in our friendships, with our neighbors, in our extended family system. Um, you know, and, and certainly intimate partners. There are important inner skills that help us to manage breakdowns in getting needs met, including in situations where we will never get our needs met from that person, maybe because they've died or because they won't communicate with us or repair. And there are things we can do inside ourselves to develop the capacities still there to not be troubled in that relationship. So how do we develop in the first strategy, the inner strengths that 
help us meet our needs and relationships in the real world. And I hope you can appreciate that my approach here, which is much like the Buddha's, really emphasizes practical self-reliance, no nonsense, yeah, causes and conditions. And we need to be the causes and conditions to the extent that we can in our own life. Well, we develop these inner strengths, and I'm using that term super broadly, in two steps, neurologically. First, we must experience whatever we want to grow. And then second, we need to internalize that experience, take in the good so it sinks in. In other words, turn to the good of a particular experience that's helpful, typically because it's already happening, or maybe sometimes because we create it. And then when you turn to that good, take in the good to grow the good that lasts inside. Again and again and again. That's the fundamental strategy. Experience whatever you want to grow and then slow down and help it sink in. I love this strategy because it's under your control and you can do it many times a day in the privacy of your own mind. No one can defeat you. No one can stop you from doing it and no one can do it for you. So you earn the fruits of your practice. There are many, many resources for developing various inner strengths that help us get our needs met in relationships, including, for example, inner strengths that help us uh, push back the bars of our invisible cage and risk the dreaded experience of being rejected by going out and trying to make new friends or even going out and dating and cultivating, you know, hopefully finding a new romantic partner. There are many resources for that out in the world, and I have a lot of freely offered stuff, and also I have online courses, including um, the Strongheart course, which you know you can pay for or get a scholarship for if you have financial need, and my book, Making Great Relationships. So there are a lot of resources for growing inner strengths that help you meet your needs in relationships so you can let go of craving in your relationships and stop suffering there. Good stuff. And I'm not going to talk anymore about it because I want to talk about and explore with you the second major strategy for helping yourself to feel that your relationship needs are already met enough in the present. The second strategy is to repeatedly take in the good of relationship needs already met enough in the present. For example, deliberately take in the good in the present, like we did in the meditation, of feeling genuinely connected to your heart. Slow down and let it sink in. Already in the heart. Take in the good of feeling um, caring toward others. Slow down and let it sink in. Or already feeling cared about in some way. Already feeling included. Let's suppose, slow down and let it sink in. This strategy is really simple. It's very effective because you're always doing whatever is authentic for you in the present. Around the authentic experience, for example, of feeling a sense of your own worth, could be some irritation at somebody who is snippy and snarky to you in an email That's present, but what you're focusing on and taking in is a sense of your own worth, let's say. That's authentic for you, okay? Um, Another reason I love this strategy is um, because it uh, helps you recognize the good news that is already real. You find yourself looking for ways to feel already whole already full, already connected, again and again and again and again and again. Um, And as you do this again and again, you're building up the sense inside yourself of being already okay in relationships. You already feel loved in this life. You already feel liked enough. You already feel worthy enough. Yeah, it'd be nice to have more people like you and so forth, but you feel already enough in that way. And as we receive the present, as Dogen quoted previously, as we feel in the present already connected, already 
full enough in the heart, then we feel filled up and not hungry. And there's no basis actually for craving. So let's explore this strategy, which is always about whatever is already true. All right? Okay. So I'm going to do this in with regard to three major things we can do. So the first one is feeling, I'll say, warm-hearted yourself. Love is love. Whether it flows in, and we want more, of course, but also love is love when it flows out. And it feeds us as it flows in either direction. So I suggest that in everyday life, notice states of caring in yourself just that are happening for real already. Just little moments of feeling, you know, you see a... <laughs> a puppy video on YouTube or a real puppy walking down the street, uh, or uh, you have a, you know, a friend that smiles at you or sends you a funny little, uh, you know, post on Facebook or something, and you just feel good. It's no big deal. Open-hearted, um, benign, you know, a sense of you're for others. You're on, you're on their side, you know, you wish them well. Um, other states of caring are things like being interested. That's a low bar. Or compassionate or kind, friendly, loyal. Um, a sense of recognizing injustice. Even if you're not talking with someone specifically, maybe you read something or you're aware of something and, and your heart is moved by it. Uh, and you have a sense of uh, maybe more, a moral response. That's a form of caring that's real. Being an ally to others. And of course, love. So when you're having these experiences, it's really helpful to flag them. And then for a, a beat, half a breath or a whole breath or several breaths in a row, kind of marinate in that experience. You're not clinging to the experience. You are becoming absorbed in it as a kind of shamatha practice, a concentration practice in Buddhist terms, an absorption practice for, you know, 5, 10, 20 seconds in a row. And in so doing, you are receiving it into yourself and you are letting yourself become established in it. It's a profoundly simple and powerful strategy. And... I don't say this to toot my horn. I say this to flag how distinctive this strategy is because it's generally not described either in the Pali Canon or in contemporary Buddhism. Deliberately, deliberately resting your consciousness in the sense of relationship or other needs met enough in the present so that the sense of this gradually sinks into you. You can also deliberately create these states of caring toward others, as we did in the meditation, bringing to mind a sense of being in the heart, um, you know, bringing to mind deliberate practices of loving kindness or compassion, classic Buddhist practices, uh, thinking about a friend, and maybe you're in a kind of trajectory of someone you have a complicated relationship with, and you know they're kind of irksome, or at least they irk you. And understandably, and you, know, you kind of reflect on that a bit, but you, you, you sort of work your way to really appreciating that they're a good person themselves and you do have a fundamentally loving attitude toward them. You're helping yourself. You're creating an experience of being warm-hearted. So you can either notice these experiences or you can create them. And once you get that song playing in the inner iPod, you slow down. Stay with it, feel it in your body, and enjoy what feels good about it. Thus, engaging different methods that are born out in research, different methods for hardwiring this experience of warm-heartedness into your own nervous system. Okay? Second, <clears throat> more challenging, 
how about feeling cared about already? Now, the more that we build up the trait that doesn't leave of feeling cared about in various ways, the easier it is to deliberately create this kind of experience. But most of the time, in everyday life, we have opportunities not to create this experience, but to notice it when it's already occurring. Someone, uh, I think of a spectrum of being cared about that I've named already, five aspects to it, sort of like steps in a ladder of uh, the significance of the caring, feeling included, seen, appreciated, liked, or loved. So when indeed it's a fact that you are part of something, part of a team, part of a cause, part of a movement, part of a family system, part of a friendship circle, uh, people you play softball with or have a book club with or are in a Buddhist gathering with, notice how that feels and flag it. Highlight it for yourself. That's an opportunity to feel already cared about. Perhaps someone uh, in everyday life has praised you or appreciated you, been grateful to you. Um, hey, can you let yourself feel appreciated? Perhaps respected. Can you let yourself actually feel respected when it's a fact that you are respected? A lot of us have big issues. We're kind of emotionally anorexic. Um, you know, we have understandable normal appetites for relationship experiences of being cared about by others. But when it comes our way, sometimes we have tiny pinhole mouths that won't let in the experience. Often, understandably, because we're afraid that if we do let it in, uh, we will want more and more and more, and then that will lead to disaster because it did when we were young or we saw it happen around us when we were young. That's understandable. You can help yourself today to really notice when it's available to you to feel what you long to feel, but you're blocking it and then see if you can soften the block and realize that you're still going to be okay. You're still going to be okay even if you let in this relational nutrition that you really, really need. And of course, you can um, deliberately create experiences of being cared about. You know, you can call to mind people in your past. I'm doing it right now. I'm bringing to mind my grandmother. Grandmothers are usually pretty easy. Uh, especially on my mother's side, uh, who I knew better than on my father's side, who was also benign, but um, not so much in my life. You know, you bring to mind someone who cares about you. Or um, you might bring to mind someone who's no longer alive. Right now I'm bringing to mind a, a cat I knew. Uh, grieving is loving. There may be a loss involved in bringing to mind, creating an experience of being cared about. And that's okay. And if you like, you can pick somebody else. You know, we, it's important to become dexterous uh, in, in being able to create useful experiences for ourselves, to, you know, move our attention away from what's harmful and problematic and er, bring it toward what's helpful and enjoyable and beneficial. That's Resilience 101. <laughs> you know, it's okay to do that. It's okay to make those efforts in the mind uh, and to bring your attention to things that are supportive for you, thus creating an experience, in this case, an experience of feeling cared about. And then uh, when you do have that experience, either way, uh, noticing it or creating it, once that experience is there, boom, especially if it's one that you know is really good for you, slow down and really, really take it in. In terms of noticing what's really good for you, this is an important detail. I think it's helpful to think about these five broad categories of being cared about, but it may be that there are particular forms of being cared about that uh, maybe were really missing when you were young. 
and or missing in a previous relationship or job or group of friends. And so it's really, it's important to um, highlight that particular relational nutrient and definitely, you know, look for it, try to create it when you can. And if it comes your way on its own, you know, don't miss the opportunity. Right now I'm hearing Eminem's you know, rap song, one shot playing in the back of my mind. <laughs> when that opportunity comes your way, wow, when that, when that slow motion ball starts floating toward you over the middle of the plate, take your swing. Uh, so for example, uh, one example I've shared with you before is that I grew up, um, you know, shy and, and young going through school, kind of a, you know, a bookish kid and not very good at sports and, you know, and so for me later in life, it's actually been an important experience for me to feel included in typically same gender type situations because it was same gender situations that were painful for me as a kid. Like in other words, a group of men today doing something athletic uh, of any kind. You know, when I was younger, I would play volleyball or football and I was pretty good at it, actually. And whoa, that was a high value experience. <laughs> you know, I still remember this studly quarterback walking past me in our dorm team uh, at UCLA when I was a freshman. And I was, I was 16, maybe I'd turned 17 by then. And he gruffly said, you know, this is macho love walking by. He was uh, older and incredibly athletic and just not big enough to play Division I football. He said, gruffly, Hanson, you're good. I'm going to throw to you more. And he walked on by. I felt I'd been blessed by a demigod, you know. Whoa. So you may know for yourself that there's some key experiences that are high value for you uh, in terms of feeling really cared about, feeling special, feeling really seen, feeling pursued, maybe wanted, um, you know, included, good enough, whatever it might be for you, not to create another strategy of craving, to try to get it, but more out of self-help, recognizing that this is a particular medicine or nutrient that would be really good for you. So it's okay to look for it. And when it's there, value it and take it in. Okay, that's the second major approach here. Of, you know, in the words, take in experiences of feeling already cared about in addition to experiences of feeling already caring. Love flowing in as well as flowing out. And then the last one, uh, which is maybe the hardest to talk about, but it's in some ways potentially the most fundamental, feeling already connected in general, just connected. This includes a sense of relatedness to widening circles of humanity, uh, extended family, friend networks, people you, friendly acquaintances, people you don't know, ancestors reaching back in time. You know, we are each the end res result in the present of an unbroken chain of mothers who had mothers who had mothers who had mothers all the way back to the primordial ooze. Wow, like just think about that. Your triple great grandparents who were, you know, primate ancestors 10 million years ago, who had a child, who had a child, who had a, let's say, you know, a, um, a child who had a child who had a child who had a child. So um, that's a sense of connection. You might have a sense of relatedness to life. You know, for me, when I take an inhalation, I can be aware that the oxygen you know, atoms and O2 molecules that I'm inhaling were given to me by green growing things in this vast, generally unseen, but continually actual circle of life. That's really beautiful to have a growing sense of embeddedness in life altogether. To our peril, humanity has lost much of its sense of that embeddedness and we need to reclaim it by becoming indigenous again in, a, in the 21st century and drawing on indigenous wisdom extremely respectfully and humbly um, 
for help in that process of rerouting ourselves in the in the living world. Um, you might have a growing sense of connection to the universe. You know, weird stuff like every atom in our body, including an oxygen bigger than helium, was made inside an exploding star. Whew. Iron in the blood, calcium in our bones and teeth, oxygen breathing, carbon molecules, organic molecules. Wow, that's a connection. As Carl Sagan put it, we are stardust connection. And even connection to the ultimate or with the ultimate ground of all, if that's meaningful for you. So these are opportunities to realize, even if you're really lonely, as many are these days, in your human relationships, even if you've lost loved ones, even if you're aging and more and more friends are you know, passing away and, and you're left behind, even so, even so, you know, even alone during the last minutes or breaths of our life, we are always already connected. We are always already being made in a vast field of relationships. Knowing that can be a tremendous comfort and opportunity for practice because it's never not the case. We are always already connected. I'll close here and with a couple of quotations from Thich Nhat Hanh. The first one is, I am in you and you are in me. If we take me out of you, then you would not be able to manifest as you are manifesting now. This is true for all of us here. Literally true. Thich Nhat Hanh, bless his memory, continues. We cannot manifest without one another. We have to wait for each other in order to manifest together. And then he continues, there is no phenomenon in the universe that does not intimately concern us. From a pebble resting at the bottom of the ocean to the movement of a galaxy millions of light years away. All phenomena are interdependent. That's a fact. Our Sangha, his spiritual community, aspires to live in harmony with the land, with all the vegetation and, and animals, and with all our brothers and sisters. When we are each in harmony with each other, we are also in harmony with the land. We see our close relationship with every person and every species. The happiness and suffering of all humans and all other species is our own happiness and suffering. We inter are. As practitioners, we see that we are part of and not separate from the soil, the forests, the rivers, and the sky. We share the same destiny. So to conclude here, um, we've been exploring how to feel already authentically related in various ways so that there's no actual basis or very little actual basis for craving in the present. We've been exploring three ways to do this. Well, first we explored two strategies, grow strengths to actually meet your relationship needs in the present. And second, which we focused on, take in experiences of feeling connected enough, liked enough, loving enough, caring enough, etc., in the present, so that you gradually internalize those experiences and they become increasingly your own ground of being. Uh, and one that you can return to fairly, fairly quickly when you get you know, kind of rattled out of it in a relationship issue, All right? Madison, uh, at 23 past, when I said we are always already connected, yes, through living, uh, we may, you know, through participating in life, uh, we are connected. Uh, in our consciousness are the effects of all kinds of relationships we've had. We have affected others. Uh, Madison and I are friends and we know each other. We are, we are already connected, even if we're not aware of it. So it's in those ways we have opportunities as practice to feel already connected. I love what Jamie wrote. 
uh, the day I hugged my CO commanding officer on Reflex, because he'd just told me I'd been selected for a commissioning program I applied to, one of those rare moments when two Marines share space like that. Yeah, and creating a connection experience uh, can be done, for example, uh, by, let's say, Jamie, by going back to that memory. If you don't have memories uh, of positive connection experiences, that's not unusual. That's a sign that it's important to start creating memories of positive connection experiences that you can draw upon. And it's an, it makes the important point that there are many other ways to notice already having good relationship experiences and many other ways to actually create good relationship experiences like being deliberately caring toward another person. A lot of times I've seen people who, you know, they understandably, um, you know, they're com complaining, they're, they're lamenting, they, you know, they're mournful, they're sad, they wish, understandably, understandably, that they had more caring coming toward them in their life because it's a thin soup in their life situation. It's real. They're kind of dead in the water about that. You know, there's not much they can do maybe, or it would be a long process to build up friendships. And on the other hand, it's under their control at any moment to be caring themselves. That's really wonderful good news. Okay, let's see. Tony from Montreal says, Hanson, the tight end. I was always super skinny. I was much more like a wide receiver. Crafty, not the best athlete in the world, but determined. Uh, animal companions are wonderful. I got a private message about this. Letting in a dog's love or affection or others. Um, you know, uh, it's also a really interesting, a bit of research here. Um, trauma, trauma is real. And it's also real to have generational trauma transmitted through cultural or psychological pathways, yes, but also generational trauma can be transmitted epigenetically through changes in the expression of genes. And I just recently read a research paper that talked about the epigenetic transmission of reactions to trauma down to the sixth generation in mice in mice. These epigenetic changes that are trauma-based in five or six generations up the stream can be detected in certain research studies. In that context, broadly, research also shows that one of the most powerful ways to reverse these epigenetic uh, impacts that are just handed down to us uh, can be through nurturing others. Nurturing a pet, um, you know, a, a 12 year old bully who's acting out their own woundedness, befriending or being put into a situation in school, a young kid in kindergarten. Those kinds of nurturing activities are a beautiful, powerful way to uh, repair trauma, particularly relationship trauma, which is another example of the value and power of claiming the agency we do have to be caring and loving in the ways we can be, both for its moral purpose and because it's good medicine, filling us and soothing us and healing us on its way, flowing out through the door of the heart. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, the series here on valuing the sense of being already basically okay enough in the present when it's true, that you're already safe enough, already satisfied enough, already connected enough in the present so that there's no actual basis for craving. It's a very, very powerful, wonderful, and liberating practice, and I commend it to you.